Uh, so um, I'm Pedro Rodriguez Vega, and I will be presenting about uh, above ground biomass estimation across tropical and subtropical Africa. This is a work I've been doing with the National Center for the Observation and the University of Leicester, but a lot of people has been actually involved in in this work. So you can see here in the slide. Uh, so. I mean, you are in a biomass workshop, so I imagine all of this introduction is meaningless, but well, uh, the forests in Africa are among the most pristine and biodiverse ecosystems on Earth. And we have like uh, tropical moist broadleaf forests, savanna, dry forests, mangrove, and all of them contain a large carbon stocks in the form of biomass. Uh, as you are aware, biomass is a key component of the carbon cycle as the dry weight of it's defined as the dry weight of vegetation, and approximately 50% of it can be considered carbon. Africa stores 13% of plant carbon and contributes to 17% of the world deforestation carbon emissions. But despite this importance, the African continent is still one of the weakest links in our understanding of the global carbon cycle. And the main reason is usually the, our limited observation network in the continent. So there are really difficult areas to access, uh, for example, in the middle of the Congo Basin, where we cannot really get enough reference data. Um, the Carbo Africa project um, estimated the, the carbon balance of the Sahara Africa in a small sink of approximately less than one petagram of carbon per year. Uh, nevertheless, other studies also indicate that, this, indicate that this sink might be already declining or is already turning into a source. So how can we improve the knowledge that we have uh, of the African carbon cycle? So what we need is better estimates of the amount and the spatial distribution of, of ground biomass stocks and their interannual changes. And this is an important issue because uh, now we are preparing for the, for example, for the United Nations Framework Conversion on Climate Change first global stock date of the Paris Agreement. So how do we tackle this issue in, in this in this project. So our approach consisted of two different steps. In the first steps, we estimated um, canopy height and we used a well-known machine learning algorithm, random forest regression. And we use this algorithm within a spatial K-fold cross-validation framework. The reason to, to use this spatial K-fold was to try to avoid issues with the spatial autocorrelation of the data, to not, not to have over-estimistic uh, accuracy assessments when we're trying to validate our products. Uh, using this method, we estimated not only canopy height, but also uncertainty at pixel level. Our reference data was uh, the space-borne Jedi uh, LiDAR footprints, but instead of using single footprints, we group these footprints, so we cluster them in groups of four. So we have a four cluster footprint, uh, or four footprint cluster, sorry, that we use as a kind of our reference. So what we assume is that we have uh, more footprints that we try to, to reduce our sample variability as we try to relate these with four pixels of 50 meter resolution. So, and then if we have our canopy height from Jedi and our uh, signal from the, from the sensors, um, assuming four 50 meters uh, pixels, our output will be produced at 100 meter resolution. And so, because we are using four footprints, we, we kind of sample more area of this um, 100 meters uh, output area. As a reference data, we use synthetic aperture radar, uh, allos pulsar and allos two pulsar mosaics <clears throat> that we have to do as some kind of temporal cross calibration to try to correct for issues in the in the time series related with, for example, soil moisture. And we also use Landsat per century cover to, as a predictor as well. Um, the second step of the approach was then to convert these canopy high models, these canopy high maps into biomass. And for this, we use a empirical model and that we, in which we estimate biomass as a function of canopy height. To develop these models, we use LiDAR-based above-ground biomass maps that uh, are located in different parts of Africa. We have an example here at the, at the bottom of the slides, for example. This is a um, biomass urban uh, LiDAR-based map in Kenya. And, uh, and then we use the root square transform regression model to estimate uh, the biomass you can see here on the, on the top right, for example. Uh, we propagate uh, the errors that we, we could assume, not only the error for predictions from the uh, random forest, but we also propagate the error from the Jedi measurements, from the time difference, uh, sampling error, LiDAR error, and all of this, uh, for example, the, the biomass empirical model as well. We carry out different accuracy assessments. 
And one of them, it's this one that we use a large independent data set of in situ measurements. It was mentioned before by Oliver. This is a large data set is uh, managed by Wageningen University and is the same they are using for validating the CCI product. So um, one of the outputs is this kind of behind models. Here's an example for 2017. And you can see also here the QS assessment. We have an error of approximately between three and four meters and a relative error of approximately 38%. Uh, this is the spatial uh, K-fold. This is for our product. This is, will be if we, if we do it randomly instead of, of uh, spatially our K-fold. And then this is another app validation in which we just basically put in there all other LiDAR data, more than 1.3 million uh, clusters that we have. And then also we validate against, against that. And it, it's a bit more op optimistic in the results in terms of relative error, but a little bit higher in, in terms of uh, running square error. Um, then this also another uh, of the outputs is our ground biomass maps. So I mentioned before 100 meter resolution and the uncertain characterization. And then when I mean uncertainty, I mean standard deviation of our predictions. Um, here we have two different accuracy assessments. The one here on the on the left is using the remaining uh, LiDAR pixels that we don't use for our modeling. So we can validate this using, for example, these pixels. And this is the validation uh, uh, using all uh, in situ data from uh, done by Wageningen University. And we can see, I mean, uh, the results are not too different in terms that we are talking about a relative error in between 30, uh, 40 and 33%. Uh, then when we have all these uh, time series maps, we can start looking at things like chains for, for specific areas, see how the probability distribution function is changing in time, moving, for example, towards lower biomass in this area. Um, we have examples here. Um, sorry, here I have a different color I created for another presentation, but basically uh, the different color is because we are looking at carbon here, so it's approximately 50%. But it's something similar to the previous slide. We can start to look at changes for an area. This histogram here is reference to this square that you can see there and how this is changing in time when you have, for example, a really strong change, so deforestation that occurs and the histogram just changes. So how, how would you approach to estimate changes, for example, at pixel level? The approach we use, it's, it's really simple. So we have our error and we have our, our, error, our estimations of biomass and we have our error bars. So if, if, if we put it you know, next to each other in time one and time two, if the change is strong enough that there is not overlapping in between the, the error bars, we will assume that there's a high probability that we have a change there. Uh, most of these changes are usually related with deforestation. When you pass from a relatively high biomass to a very low biomass, then this is quite easy to detect with the, with the products that, uh, that we produce. But then we have like, uh, how we do we deal when we have these kind of progressive changes of, in terms of gain or in terms of loss that are really small. For example, if we think about growth can be maybe five mega grants per hectare per year. That's incredibly hard to detect with the, with the products, with the errors that we have. So in those cases, in those pixels we, where we didn't detect any kind of strong change, we look at a little long-term linear regression, and then we can have a look at the slopes, see if we have significant slopes or not. One of the assumptions we do is that anything about 100 megagrams per hectare, if we have in the time one some kind of this, this biomass uh, relatively, alt, uh, re relatively high. So we cannot see if there is, for example, growth so in, in those cases where we don't detect anything in terms of uh, strong changes or in terms of significant slopes, we will assume that uh, uh, we are having the, the kind of the IPCC default values for biomass growth and for vegetation type. Um, one of the things we can see is that at continental level, we can see a kind of a switch from a net gain situation uh, of biomass stocks to a kind of a net, uh, net loss uh, is happening. And this seems to be due uh, in somehow to the increases rates of deforestation. These gray columns here corresponds to actually Hansen deforestation product. So you can see there is a kind of um, strong correlation. We also interpolate some, some data here in between. Obviously we don't have ALOS2 or ALOS data for, for some of the years for the gap, but there is a high correlation, at least at continental or biome level. So we can do this kind of extrapolation to, to include those kind of values and uh, related to the, to the deforestation rates. 
Um, here in the map, we can see, uh, for example, cumulative change. And this is for 10 years from 2007 to 2017. So we can also look for another angle and start looking at biome level. And if we look at this, then we start to see uh, where the, the, these changes uh, in, the, in, the, in the change to, to a net loss it comes from. We can see, for example, in the tropical moist broadly forests, we see that the um, biomass net change is starting to become negative. While we see in the other biomes, the situation is kind of relatively stable. Uh, so we, we, we can somehow argue that uh, most of the reason why at continental level we see this this increased loss of, uh, of biomass it is due to this the deforestation in this in this biome. So as we analyze uh, Africa-wide of ground biomass, and we use not only LIDAR uh, as a reference data, but we use synthetic aperture radar and optical sensors uh, within our machine learning framework. We face challenges, for example, in the terms of the use of radar data. Uh, this is the, our main um, sensor. And the reason the challenges is mostly related with uh, noise of the time series, as well as gaps in the, in the data availability. Our results shows that during the period we have uh, above ground biomass stocks for Africa that average to approximately 125 petagrams. That is in range with previous estimates, for example, from the biomass CCI also have similar values of biomass in the, in the range between 93 and 129. Petagrams. At pixel level, uh, we observe that most of the AGB changes that we can detect with confidence are related with the substantial and sudden AGB loss. So that means mostly relative to the deforestation. While progressive AGB gain or loss are harder to detect or to verify. Um, nevertheless, we observe at continental level uh, this increase in the annual rate of biomass lost in recent years and seems to be largely due, largely due to the increase of deforestation in the tropical moist broadly forest of the Congo Basin. Um, you can have more information also about this product and some other products. I think uh, Heather probably will do a presentation about that and, and you can see um, and play with the, with the data in, in those links here at the bottom. I, I, if there is any question or something, you can just approach me in the chat or you can also send me questions to this email. Thank you very much.